His name is Tim Urban, Harvard-trained educator, master procrastinator. I don't think non-procrastinators exist. You've likely seen some of his best work without knowing Tim is the man behind it. It's images like this one from his stick figure illustrated blog, Wait But Why, that have almost certainly shown up on your feed, making you pause and reflect, marvel at how profound and bizarre life can be. Tim Urban joins me to talk about his method and why he's written a new self-help book. This is The Interview. I'm really looking forward to this one. Tim Urban, the creator of Wait But Why and the author of What's Our Problem, joins us now from New York. Good to have you on the interview, Tim. Thanks so much for joining us. How are you doing? Doing great. Thank you for having me. Now, the question's in the title of your book. What is our problem? Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, it's a long, it's, 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 a, it's a complicated problem. Um, it, what, the, what I'm actually referring to in that question is um, the, 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 you know, I, I start off um, my, my thought process here with the, the background, which is we are, you know, it seems like um, Every everything is kind of exponentially growing. Technology is um, is exponentially increasing. You know, everything that the last um, you know I I compare human history to a thousand page book, which with each page representing about two hundred and fifty years, that would be the, you know about the quarter million year length of our species. And the last page alone, page one thousand, the last two hundred and fifty years is just not like any of the others. It's different in every way. Um, population, we were never over a billion people until the last page of the book. Um, and communication, we only, you know, you had to write letters or talk to someone in person. And now we, of course, we're communicating right now across the world. And that's incredibly easy to do. Uh, transportation was, you know, sailboats and walking and horses. Um, and uh, now it is, um, uh, you know, we, we you have the International Space Station uh, you can go to. Um, you can you know, fly on planes and submarines and cars and all of that. So it, you could just go down the line and yeah. nothing about our current time is normal because of exponential technology, uh, ex exponential kind of increase of, of technology and progress. And that is, you know, that that's great in so many ways, right? It's, it's kind of... Um, unprecedented prosperity across the globe, you know, you know, just GDP per capita and life expectancy and, you know, the amount of years that women go to school. It, it's just so many statistics where it's just like, this is the best time ever. And it's also the scariest time ever. We had the two biggest wars in history in the last century. Um, there's, you know, actual existential you know, risk happening now with things like nuclear weapons or AI or maybe climate change, whatever you want to say. We never had existential risk before. They had something that could kill off the whole species. Then, you know, maybe some pandemic, but that's about it. Um, so it's both the best time and the scariest time. And so I was like, what's up with that? And then I thought about, you know, it makes sense because technology isn't necessarily um, – just good or bad, it, it can be either. And so it just means that the good times are even better, but the things we should be scared of are even scarier actually. And like the bad times could be worse. And so the stakes are higher than ever. Mm. Now I put that thought aside, the fact that I look around in my society, at least in the US, and I know a lot of other societies have, are going through something similar. And it's like, we are, um, uh, we're kind of descending into like a, a, a craze of political tribalism um, mm. where um, we uh, people are uh, just just living in separate realities. We are forgetting kind of the basic kind of civic virtues that made our country stable and prosperous in the first place. Um, and we're losing trust in core institutions. You know, media, academia, uh, the the, ele uh, the electoral process. I mean, this is 
this is pretty, uh, you know, th this is unusual in the U.S. And it's happening at the worst time because, as I said earlier, you know, the stakes are getting higher. Right. The stakes going forward on the next page of this human history book are the highest they've ever been. And it's the worst possible time for us to be kind of um, acting, you know, childish as a society uh, and and very unwise. And so that was the big, what's our problem? Yeah. And, you know, of course the answer is long, but um, at the core of it is that I think our environment has changed very quickly. Just, you know, if you have an animal in their environment and it changes, they will adjust to it and evolution will slowly change them. Um, our environment is very complicated. It's not just the physical environment around us, but it's the way we get our information. It's the the way the culture um, that we live inside of and what its values are. Mm. Um, it's the institutions that that are around us and how much people trust them. And so there's been a lot of change in that environment. Um, I mean, first of all, just in the big picture, uh, we're we're really programmed to be probably living in a tribe in 20,000 BC, and we all live in an advanced civilization. So we're already all um, kind of out of our natural habitat here. And that's because the environment can change very quickly when you build civilization, but our biology changes very slowly. So the big picture is that we're always a little out of, um, you know, kind of our, our element here. But in the last 50 years, and even more so in the last 10 years, um, the environment's changed very quickly. The media landscape has totally changed from, in the US we have, you know, we used to have three stations that broadcast news half hour a night to the whole country. Now you've got 24 hour news networks that broadcast to half the country, that, that broadcast specifically to one tribe, and they're entertainment more than news. And that's changed a lot. That's really heightened tribalism. Yeah. You also have the advent of social media. I mean, so oh. I could go on and on. There's 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 a whole list of reasons that our environments change very rapidly, but that creates instability when the environment changes quickly and chaos. And oh. and we don't have the ability to um you know, when, when the environment stays the way it is for a while, we, yeah. we have this unwise period, kind of a wild west, and there's no rules. And then we kind of figure it out. We figure out how to live together in this environment, how to have the the actual, you know, th things work in a good way. And uh, it's when, it, when when things change so quickly, we just don't have time to do that. So that's kind of the, the backdrop of the question. Yeah. And a lot of the stuff that you talk about, a lot of the tribalism that you have in the American context, left, right, Republican, Democrat, and, and so on in the culture wars, a lot of it can be mapped onto the world because, I mean, not only because of the sort of power of the US culture, but a lot of these are common threads. We share many commonalities with social media and other such mediums. I noticed in your Lex Friedman podcast, you, um, you chose Gandhi as, and, and you discussed it, you chose Gandhi as your representative of the last 250 years for this page. And what's fascinating is all, a lot of the stuff that you talk about in the book and you have addressed in some of your work can be applied to Gandhi in terms of like some people see him as a saint and no discussion, you know, and then others have now come in with this some, some later information saying, well, Gandhi was clearly a racist and he was possibly a predator as well and he's nothing else. Like all the other achievements mean nothing. And so... So you had people arguing over his legacy as well. So, I mean, that's an interesting example because Gandhi himself is somebody who's fiercely debated right now. And it seems as if you can never get to anywhere related to some sort of nuanced, uh, complex uh, version of reality. And I feel sort of consuming your work and observing your work, work the isms annoy you. And the tribalism particularly really... <laughs> you know, rubs you up the wrong way. Tell me more about why it irritates you so much. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, when you're talking about, you know, maybe if we're talking about um, a hard science like physics, you know, there's a definite law of gravity or, or, or a, um, a, a gravitational constant, and it, it is what it is. And maybe someone will later, you know, show that it's something different. But it's black and white. It's 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 this is the number. The po po political science, social science, these are not hard sciences. The answer, there's not a clear cut black and white reality here on anything where these are the good guys and these are the bad guys. And this 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 issue we're having, it's all their fault and none of their fault. That's just not ever true. And to me, that's 
that's kind of childish thing. It's immature thinking for something like this. Like very obviously, these issues are complicated. They have nuance. Um, there aren't very clear good guys and bad guys. The tribe that you think are all bad, you're just in a tribal delusion. Like mm. if you actually knew the people and you heard their stories and you understood, you might not agree with all of what they have to say, but you would you would see them as complicated three dimensional humans, and you'd realize that these issues are complicated, and maybe you'd realize that you're not completely right and perfect about everything on your side. Um, and so it annoys me just because um, it's just not accurate. These tribal narratives they're not accurate. And but what's 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 so troubling about our time is there's always going to be hardcore political tribes far left, far right, or, you know, I would call them more lower left, lower right, whatever you want to say. Um, there's always going to be really, you know, extreme kind of ideological groups. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. That's just part of any kind of society. You're going to have those groups. And my hope would be that the people that are much more willing to compromise and just, just talk about issues with nuance and to disagree with each other and to, to you know, kind of argue with each other in, 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 uh, in the process of getting to truth and to figuring out the truth. Uh, I would hope that those people can kind of win out over time and, mm -hmm. and, and drive the direction of a country. But the, the reason that the current moment concerns me is that the hardcore political tribes have way more power than they should right now. Mm. They don't, they're not, that. There's, actually it's a minority of the country that are in these groups. It's only, you know, a small percentage of people that are really hypercharged, you know, political tribalism people. Mm. But maybe it's social media, you know, mm. it's again, we can talk about the different reasons. Those groups are way too powerful right now. People are terrified to defy them. If you say something that people, you know, in the US, if you, you know, you back to 2020, you know, 2021, if you said something that conflicted with the woke narrative, you know, right. which is kind of the, a very, it's not that that's not the left to me. I mean, it's the wokeness is very different than progressivism. It's very, you know, it's, I think it's regressive or it's, and it's also very radical. It's very Marxist. It's not into liberal progressivism, but it, it kind of dressed itself up as this is what the left thinks now. Right. And if you disagree with this, you must be right wing. Let me let and me ask you, sorry to interrupt you. Sorry, sorry, Tim, I, I apologize. Yeah. But just on that point, right? Something that's really interesting is a lot of people who have criticized that, you call it social justice fundamentalism. You don't really refer to it as wokeism in your in your book. Um, a lot of people who have started out doing that ended up being captured by the right wing. Because even though they're criticizing all of this that's happening out there on social media and stuff, they get validated by a sort of right-wing audience and they get dragged and they start to sort of only produce and cater to that audience. And they end up captured. Have you ever felt the gravitational pull of another tribe trying to claim you because you're criticizing the social justice fundamentalism? Yeah, no, that is a great point. And it's... And this it all goes together because when you're in a time when these these the loud voices are these kind of tribes and the nuanced voices, which makes up more people, are very quiet and kind of scared. Um, it is going to start to feel like there's an either or choice. Mm. Uh, and so if you're not with, you know, wokeness, you must be on the right. And like you said, it, if someone who you know had been kind of a left person and they are criticizing wokeness and they get canceled, they get destroyed for it. The right does say to them, "Come, come, you know, come with us. You're safe here. We love you here." You know, and of course, it is tempting. And you, by the way, you can go the other way. There's the Trump in the U.S. is a complete terror in that when if you're on the right and you disagree with him, if you're a Republican politician right now who says, actually, I think Biden was the fair winner of the 2020 election, which by all data, all actual accounts, he is. I mean, I looked into it. I didn't want to just accept it. I looked into it and I was like, you know, Trump's whole narrative there is not true. If you say that on the right right now, you're done right now. That's why you look at the, you know, find me prominent Republican politicians who will say, yes, Biden won that election. You can't, even though that's the ultimate, supposed to be the ultimate conservative value is like electoral integrity. And this guy is obviously, you know, doing things for his own needs. So 
those people, a lot of them now are kind of just, it seems like they've kind of moved on to, into the left. Yeah. And so the, the way I try, look, I've obviously felt different temptations myself because I'm a human and I feel tribal, I try feel my own confirmation bias and all of this. But what I've tried hard to do is just to remember that these tribes, the, the, the left, the right, to me, that's like, it's like Coke and Pepsi. It's <laughs> like, I'm not going to wear a Pepsi shirt. Right. And I'm not going to be like, I'm a proud Democrat. I'm a proud. To me, that's like, these are not worthy. These are big corporations, not worthy of your identity. And certainly these hardcore tribes, you know, if I start to say, you know what, I don't like wokeness. So I'm now I'm, I'm a right winger. I am conservative. What am I saying? I'm giving up all of my independent thought because now on every issue to maintain my identity, I have to have the conservative position. There goes all my independent thinking. So to me, it's it's very the, the the goal for me is to keep my identity very small. To basically say I'm just a person looking for the answers, and I have some views that co correspond with these people and some with these people, um, and but I'm not a anything. And um, and I think that the the, tr the tricky thing about something like social justice fundamentalism, which is a kind of my, my my term for for the woke ideology, is that it it. It frames this thing as this is the, the the new left, and if you're not here, you're right. But to me, it is the opposite of what actual like principled progressives I think stand for and have stood for, which is free speech, and it's okay to be wrong, and it's okay to be different, and um, and you know it, it enforces strict conformity, and it is very anti free speech, and it is very anti data. If you bring out data, you know you get accused of um, of you know I don't know some kind of um, you know, white supremacy tactic or something. Right. So to, to, you know, so, so I, I just think that it's very hard. There's not much clarity right now. Like that we should look at that and say, if you're a progressive and say, that's not progressive, but we yeah. can't, um, if you say that out loud, you get in trouble. So then a lot of people start to believe it. And then there's mass confusion when you have mm -hmm. mass cowardice and mass silence, you're going to now have a lot of confusion and delusion. And it's going to be easy to spread false narratives because the, the 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 dialogue has just gone silent, and you're going to end up with these two warring narratives, neither of which is based in reality, um, going back and forth, and it's going to seem like a choice between the two. And you you push for people to embrace the high rung thinking um, as opposed to the low rung thinking. Tell me tell me a little bit more about that, and then I'll follow up with a. Uh, with an even better question after that first. Okay. <laughs> Define it for us first. Right. Okay, so so the, the, the reason I came up with this ladder, this vertical ladder, yeah. is because we have, at least again, in, I think in most countries, there's this horizontal spectrum, one dimensional. In the US, you're either on the far left or the moderate left or the center or the moderate right mm -hmm. or the far right, right? And, and that's valid and that those are all different policy positions, but if you think about it, and they're different, you know, they're different philosophies, but that that's all about what you think. You know, where do you stand on these issues? What do you think? What is your uh, viewpoint? But how about how did we get to that viewpoint? How, how, how about how we think? And so to me, if you make it a square and you add like kind of a vertical axis in, to me, the high rungs are the, a little bit what I talked about earlier. It's, the, it's, it's people with a mentality that truth is complicated, that we need to disagree with each other to find the truth. Disagreement's okay. It doesn't mean you're, being wrong is okay. Um, and it's kind of treating it like a, a scientist in a lab. You're going to throw out hypotheses. You're going to test them. You're going to test them through argument. And you're going to eventually realize that in a liberal democracy like the U.S., you have to compromise and you're not going to always get what you want. And that's OK. It's just kind of to me like grown up political thinking. The low rungs is the opposite. It is it, it, it is instead of instead of kind of starting with I don't know and searching for truth on the low rungs it starts with of course I know we are right you know here are the 10 issues and here are the correct positions on those 10 issues and here are the incorrect positions and then there's just a lot of confirmation bias and cherry picking the statistics and studies that fit with your view kind of like an attorney would in a courtroom yeah. who's trying to show that prove to the jury that is just you know make one one side of the case and so that thinking also comes along with a lot of, you know, there's no compromise. And instead of seeing the other side as kind of like, I think they're wrong, or I think that, you know, I disagree with their their view, it's it's that they're evil, they're bad, and that that all the problems are their fault, and that the answer is not to argue with them, but to try to silence them, and that they're disgusting people, you know, this dehumanizing language. So to me, I think so much more valuable than are you on the left or the right is to me saying, you know, are, are you are you this kind of high rung? You know, thinker, or are you? And I think we all can go back and forth. But my goal, to me, is not to try to figure out if I'm left or right. It's to try to 
force my to try to remember to go up, climb, climb up that ladder when I'm being tribal, when I'm when I'm being when I'm cherry picking my own evidence because I want to make a case right. and say stop, climb the ladder, <laughs> look for truth, put your identity, the backpack, yeah. you know, that your identity is wearing, put it down. So just free yourself of that baggage. Um, and so yeah, I think I think it's I think it's a valuable. It's not the only. We still need left, right, and center, but it's a valuable second axis that we can use to have better discussions about this. So I promised you a better question as a follow-up once we had a definition. So a lot of the stuff that would naturally inspire a person to want to create content or to put out a message is stuff that maybe has a depth charge that kind of triggers the low rung. You want to immediately respond and say, this is crazy, you're stupid, you're an idiot. Oh my God, this is insane. I need to respond to this. So you see all of this happening out there something propels you to want to create a message. How do you embrace high-rung thinking, putting out a high-rung message using stick figures? Tell me about that <laughs> process and that challenge. Well, I, 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 I use a lot of stick figures and drawings just because I'm a visual learner. I like, I like when an article has or a book has a lot of images. Um, and so I do that myself because I think that other people like me will like it. I also think that it's nice to, if you use some humor, it helps to, actually I actually think it helps to bring people's high rung minds out because if you're using humor, it's just a reminder, like, look, we're all friends here. Like, like this is hard. This is, there, 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 there's a little bit that's funny about the whole thing. Like we're a bunch of pri forest primates that are like stuck in an advanced civilization and we're having like old school tribal wars because we're like misinterpreting the society, the, the, the environment we live in and we're like acting like primates. And the whole thing's a little funny. And I think once you get there, we can all kind of like laugh, like give each other a hug and say, okay, let, let's, just, let's just talk about this. And, and I'm not gonna be right about everything. And you know, you're not gonna agree with everything, but let's just have a discussion. And I think, that if I'm doing, if I'm sitting down at lunch with someone and I want to have a productive political conversation and they disagree with me, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to bring humor into it. And I'm going to also just acknowledge, you know, start off and acknowledge that I'm probably wrong about some of this stuff. I'm sure you're right about some of this stuff, but here's my point of view. And I'd love to hear what you think. That tone, mm. we all have the switch in our head. We can be down on the low rungs or that. That tone just brings people's high rung minds out and it, quiets their low romance. Now, instead of I say, you and your people are the problem. And, and it's because of people like you that we have these issues here and like, you know, and, and you're just too stupid to see it and you're too delusional to see it. And what's that gonna do? That's gonna, <laughs> their, their, low, their low rung mind is going to Well, we could, we could, we, we could cut that. Say, yeah. No, it's actually. <laughs> we could exactly. cut that and so, we could right. actually put it out as a promo. And so we have Tim Urban you saying, you exactly. and your people oh, are the good. problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's that. There's one of your 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 graphics, one of your beautiful drawings, which is you know your life path up until now, and sort of you've only you've only had one path, and you haven't used any of the other paths that were available. But then there's a dividing line, and it shows you the infinite possibilities of the alternate paths from from here on in. Now that thing I sent out to my teenage daughters, to my middle-aged friends, and everybody could relate to it. And I think there's something fundamental to something like that, it inspires gratitude and perspective. When, when I tell you that randomly around the world, I'm, I'm South African, I have friends of different nationalities, live in different places, different ages, backgrounds, um, profess different faiths or no faith, every single person you know, adds a heart or says, wow, that's beautiful. That's, you know, it gave me some perspective. How do you feel to know that people from all over the world that aren't looking at this from a tribal perspective are relating to your little scribble, your animation, your piece of work? Um, I, I, I think it's amazing. I think we live in an, let's you know, people, we complain so much about social media and the current times and everything's bad. But actually, there's such a beautiful side to all this stuff too. There, there's such a good side to social media as well. And this is an example where I can have an idea in the shower. I thought about it with my own life. Um, you know, that like, man, we spend so much time focusing on the roads not traveled, you know, the ones that got away, the opportunities that we lost. And the implicit idea, you know, feeling 
is that we had agency. You know, we could have had those. If yeah. We messed up. We, those were in our hands and we didn't do it. But then we look at the future and we think, but now I'm on this life path. And um, and and that's just where I am. But it's like, where's the agency? Because in 20 years, when you look back at today, you're going to see all these, you know, things that you could have done. And it's a reminder that it's all in front of us. You know, we actually have all of these, all of those lines that life passed, they're all available to us right now, you know, and that it's, it's never too late to make a change, whatever. So I can have that thought and I can post it on social media. And it can, you know, if you think about it, that's just thought that happened in my brain in the shower and now it can go and 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 can it can send the message into so many other brains and um if people resonate you know look i put out a lot of stuff that doesn't go anywhere it doesn't resonate you know and once in a while you throw you put something out that really clicks and it's just i think it's a really beautiful thing about the world that that you know um that people can uh, share uh, an inspiring m message or thought, and it could just go across the planet. I mean, yeah. 200 years ago, you couldn't do that. You would tell the 10 people that lived around you, um, um, and that would be it. So I think there's, I don't know, I think I think it, it gives me a lot of hope too. There's so much beauty in the world, and there's so many, um, there's so many, uh, most people are, are good. If you actually knew the story of most people, it's totally like sympathetic, and you'd understand why they are the way they are. And so, yeah, just, I have a lot of hope because of that. And then also I get very worried because right. of uh, all the other things I've talked about. Tim Urban, there's no one like you on this planet. And I'm very grateful that uh, we got to talk to you. What's Our Problem? A Self-Help Book for Societies. That's Tim's book. I hope you'll all try and get it. Tim, thank you so much for joining us on the interview. Thank you very much. Take care.